So welcome everyone. Uh, I am going to start this very important and moving event. I am Leah Shortino. I am the founder and director of C Junction and C Junction is this uh, venue that you see here. Uh, we try to address all kinds of issues related to Southeast Asia, all the beauty of the region as well as the challenges. And today, we will be uh, talking about a very serious uh, challenge, unfortunately, not only for Myanmar, but also for other countries in the region. But today the spotlight is on Myanmar. And uh, we are fortunate in this fortunate, in a little bit strange sense, since it refer uh, to the topic of political uh, prisoner, but we are still fortunate to have beautiful uh, drawing of the terrible conditions, there is a contradiction here, but it is true. They are beautiful drawings of the terrible condition of insane uh, prison, which is the most infamous uh, prison in Myanmar that has always been the place where political prisoners have been all held, but also uh, all kinds of other people who have committed crime or have been accused of committing crimes. And uh, particularly this opening event refers to an exhibition of drawing a down back mound who is here beyond us. He is in my thought at the moment and he will be our first speaker. He will tell us a little bit about himself as well, about his experience and uh, the role that drawings has played in that experience. And then I will introduce the other uh, speaker of the panel who bring a different experience from Myanmar, as well as Latin America, as well as Thailand. But please, Oh, I should say also, sorry, one moment. We are going to, he's going to talk in Burmese and we have here a translator who will translate not simultaneously, but brief paragraph and then he will translate. So please. Okay, say salu ya, Babi. Hello. Hello, Minglava. You know, but this Hello, Minglava. Uh, I am artist and I am a painter, and my name is Mangpo. I mentioned myself artist, but I have been apart from this job for more than ten years already. ကျွန်တော်မရက်ကင်ဒီဘကြီလောကနေမှုထွက်ကင်တော့ကျွန်တော်ဘကြီကိုပိုင်းပြခံခွင့်ခဲ့တယ်ဘကြီအထူးဖ
the main reason I stopped painting is because of our son also. We are a family of three, and among them, my wife's income is kind of higher than my income. So I I choose to take care of my son. So that's the reason I stopped painting. เออเนี่ยดาเนี่ยท่านนั้นเสร็จดิอนาเตมุဖြစ်တဲ့အခါမှာတော့ဟိုကျွန်တော်တို့အားဟိုတနိုင်ငံလုံးဒုတူအားလ
2021 April 7 around 9 p.m. in the evening around 40 people including soldiers and the police came and raid into my house oh, rushing into my house and then without uh, posting any question or comment they arrested me they hit me and they kicked me on that night ไอ้หมอตรุยอกลาได้ค่ะจ้ะไอ้หมอมาดอซันซูจีโบมิวดอซันซูจีเนี่ยปูสตาร์ดีนอกดีเอเนอรีเนี่ยปัดเด็ด
that my talent is an opportunity to meditate myself, to keep my mind together with my body. Approximately around 200 people's portrait. I, I drew around 200 people's portrait as a gift for them, as a memory. And I put my name and the phone number for them also. It's almost 200 people. They try to find a way to bring that people out. But most of them have their own way to bring out the portraits of themselves. But for me, uh, the way I did is risky, but I was very lucky. You know, I have a lot of pieces of diaries and also around 70 pictures. And I was lucky enough to be able to bring it out of the prison together with me. Okay, you know, uh, with my talent, I was able to do a lot of things within the six months in the prison. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I am sure later on we will come back to you uh, to maybe to explain uh, on this side, there are some segments of the diary. So there are um, many more pages. They are written on very small piece of paper, but when they are translated and written in Burmese, then of course become quite a lot of pages. So we have only few here just to show uh, what we mean with this diary. There are some fragments about his experience as well as some other cases while on the table and also on the other side, you will see his original drawing. The one in the back there, they are photocopy because like he say, he donated to some people. So there is only uh, the photocopy left. There is no original for that. Now I must uh, say this exhibition was born thanks to Synergy and Synergy we have here uh, Tat, I call him Tat, that's where. And then he is really uh, the one who initiated the first time there was a small, a smaller exhibition in my thought in his place. And then later on, 14 uh, of this uh, drawing were brought to Chiang Mai. So this is actually the third exhibition, uh, but with the original painting as well as translation of uh, the writing. So that is the additional value of this uh, particular, but we were inspired by what was done in my thought uh, previously. So he will be telling us about <laughs> why he think this is important and also tell us about the situation of artists in exile and also we want to talk about a condition the prisoner condition now in Myanmar so please that thank you Lear and Fijanshin for hosting this good evening everyone um, my name is Tasu Win and I am the um, demography activist from Myanmar and yeah, I'm also one of the exiles living in Mesot, Thai Burma border. And um, I fled uh, Burma um, in April 2021, while they raided my house and office. And I lived uh, about seven months in the jungle in the Kiyanyu control area. And then 
I left to Minnesota, um, then like trying to support uh, people uh, who are in need. So all in of the talents from all over the Burma, they are just gathered in this small town. So in Minnesota, and officially we have about uh, 20 to 30,000 in between uh, refugees are living over there, you know, uh, secretly. But uh, most of the people's life are uh, in very uh, difficult situation. <clears throat> a, a daughter friend of mine, um, he was a, a sergeant before, but, you know, he became a, a delivery man, riding his bicycle, you know, delivering food, you know, to uh, all of the neighborhood. And also a teacher friend of mine, and uh, she was a like, head teacher of a kindergarten school. She became a factory worker who was only getting like 2,000 pack per, per man. So this kind of situation that, you know, all of the, the lives of the, of the you know, refugees in Minnesota is like, you know, turning upside down. And also, of course, like, you know, among them, the artists are also there. So like, I have also been working with artists uh, since before the group, like, so as, I was, uh, as I was an activist and also my organization, The Synergy, is also uh, been dealing with working with the artists to, you know, um, uh, make a social change, like to, to uh, through art, you know, to you know, promote social change. This is what we did since before the group. So we are like promoting about the social cohesion, social harmony and et cetera. So uh, we uh, like, you know, uh, we have been uh, having a good connection and relationship with artists and then, you know, we are like, you know, having them around since before, it, during, even during the COVID time. So we have them too. So, um, so when, you know, I was staying in Mesa, when I was like uh, trying to support all of the communities, then um, yeah, I got to connect with uh, many artists as well. So I did not know Kupo before, but I knew him um, through one of my poet friends. So he introduced me and him. And I also heard about him through some media. Like when he uh, released, then like, um, I think some international media also, uh, you know, cover about, you know, his portraits in the prison. And then because of these, uh, these uh, articles, then uh, even after he released from the prison, he had to uh, run away again because like they tried to arrest him again uh, after uh, uh, releasing this article. So he wasn't safe and he, he fled here. And then uh, my friend introduced me and also like, I heard about him. And then after, after that, Gopo showed me like, you know, some of it at works there. So these were amazing. So then like, they also had an idea of like, you know, wanted to do you know, an exhibition over there. So I actually had a, uh, uh, like a tea shop in Mayfield. It's like a kind of a meeting place for Burmese people. It's called Lule Yi, like in Burma, we call it freedom. It's like uh, a place for the exile community that, you know, after of it, we have a, a, sp a small space that can hold events. So uh, they also wanted to do the exhibition there. So why not then, you know, we, um, uh, like set up the exhibition, it was very successful. And then like, you know, he also, um, some of his friends from Chiang Mai also like wanted to do this exhibition and it went out, you know, to, to reach to the broader audience. After that, I also knew with Leah through some of my friends and then you know, I told her about his uh, portraits and then, you know, this happened. Like, you know, uh, it's really uh, um, like, great for us too, because it's not just about, you know, recognizing his at work, but also very important for the uh, transition adjustment, you know, that we have to bring for our country when we got a democracy in the future, because um, these are the history. Like, you know, we have only heard about the life of the prison, you know, just, you know, from the former prisoners, but not like, you know, these uh, detailed pictures and also the, the each stories of each and every person. So these, uh, these are like, you know, uh, incredible actually. Well, we have never had this kind of art pieces about the Burma prison before. And also his uh, uh, diaries are very detailed. You know, you can get a lot of information through his diaries and that, what, what have happened over there. Of course, like we also have like, other people who talk about the, 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 the situation of the interrogation and also situation of the prisons. But, you know, uh, 
uh, in thief can be a lot more, you know, fever than that we can imagine because like Burma prison is like the most notorious one in the world. Like, you know, for example, the cell that Kupo lived is only meant for like about 40 to 50 people, but they have lived more than 200 people together. Just they were stuck in this like, you know, animal that they put there. And also like, you know, torture and everything. Like, you know, they did not even give any like, uh, you know, medicine and medication for the people who are in need. Like there are also some uh, LGBT being discriminated in the, you know, um, in, in the uh, prison cells. And also some of the HIV positive people were not get, you know, right treatment by the prison officer and et cetera. For this situation that, you know, maybe you can get it, look at from the uh, diaries and also like, you know, you can get from other people as well. And yeah, this is the situation of the uh, people over there and also situation of them. And also the Burma as a whole, we are still uh, in a, a very bad situation, I would say. And then like even a few days ago, they sent us, uh, uh, one young guy was uh, got a death penalty and then the other five were got uh, life imprisonment. And also like there are many more you know, uh, you know, sentences as well, because they just, uh, the military just show the world, like, you know, when they give amnesty that, you know, people just applaud them. But, you know, after they clean up the prison cells, this is just like they're cleaning up the prison cells, then they will put many more prisoners later. So this is also the one thing we cannot forget about it, right? And also, um, the cyclone uh, that just hit to the uh, Rakhine state, actually, the uh, situation of the Rohingya uh, camps are also like a prison. And we call it like, you know, live in hell. That, you know, they, they're such a, I've been there several times, like both in Rakhine and also in the Cosmos as well. So their situation was really, really bad. And then, you know, they just use Cyclo to enforce their genocide, to continue their genocide. Like more than 400 Rohingya people died by Cyclo that, you know, without any prior warning by the authorities. So this is the ongoing atrocity, ongoing crimes that Burmese military uh, did to the you know, uh, venerable people like Rohingya people. But um, uh, not only to this, but also like, you know, in the uh, borderline, like uh, in, in the Thai Burma border, like just three days ago, if I'm not wrong, like the, in the middle of night, around two or 3 a.m. in the morning, it was a very big explosion that the whole mess out was like shaken. That the, I had later that, you know, they just threw about like, you know, 500 pounds, you know, uh, bombs from the, you know, uh, aircraft, like about several bombs that they just, you know, uh, dropped uh, to the border and then the whole tower was shaken. So, uh, you know, people were like, you know, quite afraid. And also there were a lot more refugees uh, in the you know, upcoming days because like not even because the rainy season is already starting. Normally they stop doing the you know air fight you know from the, in the, during the rainy season, but they are still doing it. And also um, the uh, the fighting. Uh, I mean, like our resistance groups are also preparing to fight. You know, in these days, because they they gonna be like you know a lot more intense uh, situation. And uh, you know, as a uh, person living in a border town. And then we are like, you know, also preparing uh, to support uh, the refugees if anything happened. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for this sobering overview. And now we go to. Sorry. Thank you. I forgot about the microphone, sorry. Okay, so uh, thank you for this sobering overview, I was saying, and now we go to our PO, is a lay counselor and also human rights activist who has also experienced arbitrary uh, detention in Myanmar. And she will talk about her experience as well as counsel providing of counseling service to victim and survivor on prisoner, et cetera, with trauma, please. How, 
เอ่อนเมกาอภิโลกขอบายเอ่อและชื่อมาแล้วดีสบายๆนอกเหนือดีสิทธิ์ตะกะดีสิทธิ์จอยอ่ะลุ้มเหลาไหลตูยีกูเ
and their, their hands were shaking. And whenever they screamed that they are scared, they, they took the shaking hand and stomp with the military boots. And there are a lot of sex, sexual harassment uh, to the female victims also. And sometimes they uh, abuse us by restricting for us to go to the toilet. We are not allowed to go to the toilet. Sometimes they use the electrical teaser to torture uh, some of our friends. And, and some of my friends who were female also were tortured and they hit the ear until the, the blood come out from the ear. And they didn't give any medical care also. เอ่อเปียดีญมาก็ลุงโยจะผิดเลยอิสลามบาดาวันผิดเลยด้วยดีวัตตาอะเดนจีไอนาวเปียดีพยาสาบ่เนาะโหราบาดาพยาสาอะ
Uh, I had a lot of trauma that I had a lot of trauma that when I see the sun and the cloud, I feel very sad because of the past experience. And I also become angry when I see people happy. And then I have a lot of sleep. Uh, I, I don't want sleeping problems that I don't want to sleep on the mattress anymore. I want to sleep on the floor only. And uh, according to with the experience, I don't want to use dishes, good good dishes or good plates anymore. I want to use the banana leaves or the steel plates that we used to uh, eat there. And then when I see good food, I want to cry. And, and I also had a lot of nightmares when I sleep. And my nightmares is like I was looped in a room in the detention center and the whole uh, out of the dream, I cannot go out from the loops. You know, and that's my that's the nightmare I'm still having. And even though I have been there in the detention center for three months, the trauma is that big. So, oh, the Nimata Bobio, a Jai Nabamia, a Tema Sini, do we, the Nabamia, a Navy of Pian Lola, do we, Mia Sini, the one also, oh, do you, the Nimananga, we are the the Tonay Lonis and Jemayo, the Tonay Tekedo. เอ่ออ่านวิทยาวิสุยนามาตรุมาไสบายไสหาดีทรอมาไบไสแทนยายะอะมยายิเจนแกออกมาบ่เนาะสรุปเอ่อเอ็ดโลจ้องยายโปเ
So those who have been in the prisons, they don't have anyone to call. They don't have any mean to make them safe in custody. When they get arrested, when they're on the street, when they carry small pills of amphetamine, when they are huge tribe and have to be living in a very difficult situation. So they were unknown, unseen and poor, but we have the biggest prison population for such a long time. And that means family of detainees who been through traumas so for such a long time. I have been uh, working as a human rights activist and also now I'm a lawyer, human rights lawyer. Prisons always my favorite destination. Whenever I go, I always trying my best to, to visit. It has been strictly for not strictly controlled. Uh, when, how are, we need to make a lot of connections. We need to make a lot of effort in order to be able to go into the prison and then very simple activity like donations or anything that we wanted to, to open up the space for them, no? I, I know I don't have long time, but I have a lot of things to say. Anyway, the prison conditions in Thailand has been not, not knowing, but due to the political prisoners who has been charged under the cases related to, related to freedom of expressions, including 112 and other democratic movement, including charges like what I have, but luckily I'm not in the prisons. They came in and out frequently because the political situation in Thailand uh, has been so bad in the past. I don't know when to start that timeline, but anyway, in the past three years, so we have so many more stories coming out from the prisons because those activists are not scared to speak. Unlike the other majority of the population who are so poor and not knowing when they say what will happen. And they have nowhere, nowhere to go and complain, no? Anyway, Sorry, I. Uh, so the prisoner situation were not coming out, but when the activists have spent sometimes, sometimes three months, one year, or many more people are coming and speak out, we heard more about the serious condition, especially death in custody, torture inside, and also other ill treatment, including so solidarity confinements and other violence that had happened. The only project that had been able to be uh, conducted in the, in the prison is all loyal projects. So artists, <laughs> you know, Thailand is really very famous on tattoo. So maybe I can say about the art in prison, the most that open is tattoo. But after the coup d'etat in 2004, the control of the prison as much more, sorry, 2014, much more strict. So the tattoo were absolutely prohibited from that time. We and really need something to drive <laughs> arts expression in Thailand much more than what we perceived. So I really admire our friend from, from Myanmar, I can't pronounce your name, but we have something like this coming out, it's a courageous. In Thailand, we have one friend named Pon Thip Man Kong. She was also charged under the 112 and she had spending I can't remember how many 
month, but more, more than one year, two years, she had produced her memo. And same thing happened. She smuggled all the little notes and books, not books, the, the newspaper or something. That, and then she written something. And then she come out with a big thick of book uh, that you may, if you read, you can read something related to the prison condition, woman prison condition. And she continue working with the prisoners until today, even she have to leave the country. So going back to what I have been doing related to art in the prison before I would give some hope about the new anti-torture and enforce disappearance act, which actually will benefit to also our friend in, uh, in Thailand as a refugee or migrant workers. We have been working in the southern of Thailand, documenting torture as well. I have documenting around 500 cases of Muslim detainees was arrested by Thai military under the martial law for throughout 18 years. So we try our best to tell Thai authority, to tell Thai police, to tell government, but it's not successful to lift the martial law. So that means people arrested, suspect of being insurgents can be put in anywhere in the camp in the South for seven days without a lawyer, without any assistance from outside the world. But the visit of the family is around. But Anyhow, torture has happened, disappearance has happened, but no redress, reparation has just come. So what we can do is we have been working with the victim of torture and also the family. Uh, have some friends who are the artists and also psychologists working with them to relieve and heal by having a session called body map which we, I, I did not come bring it today. But anyway, there is a, a way how we can help you and other friends who are living in the difficult situation through arts and also therapy, which I think is lacking a lot in the situation that our friend from Myanmar is, is coming through. So we can do more if we have more democracy here. And there is a hope coming. Hopefully, you all would help being a safety net for Thai politics and Thai political situation where and how we can be more open and more warmly or welcome our friend from Myanmar and actually bringing the situation in, in the regions. Maybe just one last one about the Anti-Torture Act and Enforce Disappearance Act. Throughout the history of Thailand, the justice system are broken, but perceived as not seen by many of us until not many years now, because we are uh, under monarchy and also strict rules and really well-established situation like the judiciary and whoever that uh, have presented well. Anyway, the Anti-Torture Act has come through fully implement on the 18th of May, 2000, this year, 2023. We were successfully putting a number of crimin, uh, principles within this domestic law, including absolute prohibition of torture and enforced disappearance, some safeguard for arrest and detention, within uh, the custodies, including non lethal Hmong. It's a uh, customary law, which Thailand are not quite respect, but it has been now written in our law. So we can use it, we can implement it, and, and, and trying to improve the situation of non lethal Hmong to any nationality that are not safe to return and being protected under this Thai law. We also have provision of universal jurisdictions. That means uh, if 
there is evidences, there is the uh, well found of torture systematically happening in Myanmar, and what if ever happened, the general coming to shopping or doing dentist somewhere here, we can arrest them. But it needs a lot of work. It needs a lot of effort from the victim like our friend here. Speaking out is not easy, but to be able to speak is for you and for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And indeed, very important uh, refoulement. So people cannot be sent back to their country if there is a risk of uh, suffering from violence. So that means people from Myanmar in Thailand, they cannot be sent back to Thailand if there is, uh, to Myanmar. <laughs> and and now we go to the last speaker for the panel, Namar Altamirano, Nadia. And she's a Franco Nicaraguan, so she will bring uh, to the panel today her experience in uh, Latin America. Yes, thank you. And thank you to uh, Sia Junction for this opportunity, especially because uh, uh, the drawing of the artists, of Myanmar artists, are really impressive and it's a real. Um, testimony of what is going on in inside prison. Uh, Myanmar, as you know, even if I'm going to talk about my experience on Latin America related with political prisoners, it's not going to be a big difference. It's everything that I'm going to say is going to be an echo of what is happening in countries like Myanmar, of course. I know Myanmar, I used to live there, and I feel very close to what's happening there also. Um, as you know, um, in Latin America, we used to have a decade in the 60s, so it was very known for awful dictatorships, and all the issues related with political prisoners were very, very clear about citizens who are engaged in political organizations. The difference now is that in the last 10 years, we are having a big wave of repression for different governments in the region who are targeting everyone. And that's very, make very, a lot of links with the situation, like I say, of Myanmar. So it means that anyone can be targeted just because it was in a protest or outside or say something in the media or in the social media, for example. So we have this kind of new, uh, new wave of, of uh, especially um, criminalize any kind of protest or any kind of uh, opinion that is against some different regimes. There are three major uh, countries that are very um, similar to what we know in the region in Southeast Asia, that they are very, Bad today, like by bad students on human rights issues today, especially for political prisoners. Cuba is the first one, Nicaragua and Venezuela. So if we talk about artists, for example, there have been in the last two years, a lot of artists in the region, especially in these three countries who have been, been political prisoners just because they, like the last time was a graffiti guy in La Habana who just make a drawing in a wall about Fidel. When Fidel died, he put this drawing and he put something like he left. And then that day he was in jail. That day they came to take him and it was 30 years of sentence for that drawing. So it makes a lot of echo what is going on in Myanmar. So I think it's important that we can build see this um, education bridge that we can learn some successful experience and have more hope of how we can help uh, to uh, the families and the victims and survivors for this abuse of political prisoners. So like, like I was saying, um, there is also, um, for, so if I talk 
specifically, for example, of the case of Cuba, uh, there is a crisis that started two years ago related with COVID, right? And it's more, more than political crisis, it's an economic crisis. So it was a lot of protests on the street, particularly from students who call it. And the response, of course, of the government was very harsh and repressive. And today we are counting officially that Cuba had more than 1,000 political prisoners, including children and teenagers. That's a big thing, okay? And the numbers are continually growing. So in the region, actually, Cuba, in the American region, is actually the largest number of political prisoners are concentrated in that little island. Um, each month, we have uh, data that Cuba jails an average of 30, new, 30 or 35 new political prisoners, officially, that we know. Um, as you know, there has been a crisis in the last 10 years also in Venezuela. Uh, and it's very knowing that has been, the government has, has been accused of imprisoning and also political opponents and dissidents. But at, like the other countries in the region, they also, and also in Southeast Asia, there have also been um, many of them in Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and other countries in the region, they're all being held without any trial and all being subject to human, inhuman conditions and mistreatment. Um, in Venezuela, for example, we have some of the political prisoners, um, the leader of the opposition, Leopoldo Lopez, or the major of Caracas, the former major of Caracas, Antonio Ledesma. So to end on the three bad students in the region, I can talk about Nicaragua is one of my countries. After 2018, we have a major crisis also that it was more social and economical crisis who become a political crisis who lead the student lead the protest. Of course, we can see how the rhetoric and how is the same line timeline in different countries, especially when the political crisis came and the role of the young students on the street. This is very important. So um, the Nicaraguan government also assumed a policy of brutal repression. And in addition to forced disappearance, until some months ago, Nicaragua had more than 300 political prisoners, most of them students, opposition leaders, journalists, and human rights defenders, but also artists. So many of the artists, they're being, because it was too much um, commotion and a lot of media about the political prisoners in the region, what they start to do is that they pick up the artists as singers, rock singers, even the revolution singers of the night of the 70s, that was quite impressive. Um, and taking them at nighttime and drop them in the border naked most of the time without papers. So they are being forced also to the exile, most of them, and being deported from their own country. Uh, in the last month, months ago, for example, we have, we never had that in the last years in the region. <clears throat> the last time that we had that bad experience was with Pinochet in Chile. Uh, the Nicaraguan government expelled 220 political prisoners to the forced exile. And they are, and they erase all the documents. They don't have more nationality. They don't even recognize them in professional background and they lost everything. They are officially stateless. So this is a major way on how the just, justice system can be used in different regimes to repress. So for me, it's more to understand that we are living different situations and these situations are repeatedly the same in different contexts. So we have uh, 
and the challenge for the families and the political prisoners are huge. We should have better instruments to support them or to act in the international level. So I'm gonna finish on that. Uh, you all already talk about the challenge uh, for the families and the political prisoners, um, but I would like to just finish on two things. I think uh, the challenge for political prisoners to have legal support in their own countries is very important to take care of it. Um, sorry. Thank you. Especially because it makes different to them to seek justice um, and also to report any mistreatment that is happening and ongoing. Um, the forced exile that you already talk with the experience, um, it's also have a very, like we say, effects and the trauma that is behind, but also expose them to more human rights violations and, for example, situation of deportations in different countries. We have the crisis, for example, Myanmar, Thailand, but you also have the crisis, Colombia, Venezuela, then U.S., with all the all these crises push all this movement who, of, of immigrants and refugees who are looking to flee from the countries. So we should have better uh, strategies to, uh, to make sensitization with uh, people who make decisions at the international level uh, for this movement of people, right? Um, but for me, the most important when you have this kind of exposition is that you have, like somebody was saying, very important information about the conditions. But we, what can we do with this information? Which is just a testimony, or can we try it to use it to different things? Um, I think it's uh, very important that we can try to report, and this is what I think in Latin America we are trying to do, how to use any testimony of uh, the situation of political prisoners on data and how this data can be used to uh, legal actions, when, especially when we are seeing you know, trying to find transitional justice, right? Um, this legal action means how we can report this, how we can use this information uh, to present in international courts or in courts in third countries who are related with this, with this problem. But for all that, I mean, because we know that there are many ways to make uh, pressure to uh, freedom, to, to push governments to free the, the political prisoners, um, we know there are many diplomatic pressure, for example, or legal action and sanctions, et cetera. But um, there is also a need, I think, in these situations of uh, deeply need of technical and financial support to civil society organizations on the ground, uh, specifically in the community level organizations who are actually, who require in this kind of crisis and this amount of case of political prisoners uh, to report, to create data and, and, to, and, and to make, for example, uh, awareness about the situation in a proper way. But that requires a lot of support, including financial and technical, like I was saying. But, <clears throat> So this information can be used, maybe not in 30 years that we used to have that in the region also, but maybe use uh, this information sooner and we don't need to wait 30 or 40 years uh, to, the, to the victim have uh, access to justice. Thank you. Thank you again for, it's very important, I think, to broaden the discussion and indeed show that the issue we are dealing 
Uh, although at this moment, we are very concerned about Myanmar, it's not only about Myanmar. I open the floor. We have only time for one round. We have also quite a lot of questions from uh, the Facebook. So just who wants to ask or comment? Three people maximum. Okay, introduce yourself and we will take the question and then give a chance to the panelists to react. Okay, hi, I'm a journalist for the Bank of Post. I have a question. I would like to address a, a question to a few. Uh, how do you cope with post-traumatic pain? And the second one is uh, can you talk about the body map? Thank you. Okay, wait, we, we take the question and then the three question and then uh, you can all uh, reply. So anyone also here? From comment or question? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Martha. I'm a social worker and student at Chula Longkorn University. I like hearing about art making as a process in transitional justice and I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit and how we can support uh organization like Synergy. I'm very interested. Thank you. So yeah, no, then I take two uh, questions from uh, the internet. One uh, with the change, the voting change in Thailand, the Orange Revolution, do you expect any improvements on the issue of uh, asylum, Bur Burmese asylum seekers? So that will that bring some changes eventually? Uh, that is one question for the artist. I think what is going to happen? Uh, are you going to make a book? Uh, of your diary and your drawings. Art. Okay. Uh, one question for you, no? Okay. My effort. Okay. I'll. I like to maybe I'll explain about the body map. Okay, uh, you may know the situation in the southern of Thailand, where there is a so-called insurgents group uh, has been uh, fighting or has been trying many other ways to negotiate with Thailand about the change of governing in the south. But the declaration of the martial law since 2004 have kept Thailand, the southern part, uh, next to Malaysia is an internal armed conflict for such a long time, unknown, but making Bangkok people happy that we leave everything to the military for, for that, with a lot of budgeting and also a lot of loss. 7,000 or more people have been killed and also more than 10,000 have been arrested. 30 cases of enforced disappearances and also still that same law, which is 107 years old law, still being applied. So when I start working in the southern of Thailand, we start to document torture. And it's actually, I brought it, but I did not bring, but it's actually the situation happened in the south related to torture situation also coming from the 911 situation. And this is the piece of art by a detainee who's still in the Guantanamo. But he was here in Thailand in 2002. And the waterboarding and other torture session is actually happening in Sai Green, which is already open fact. It is Thailand. So torture have been taught to Thai authority as much as to one uh, to Latin America and other country and it's, it's, it's open training. It had been happening everywhere. Anyhow, so torture had happened very widespread in the South. What we can do is document report and trying to telling the Thai authority and also international community about it. 
we cannot make any change and because ignorance of Bangkok people and all over Thailand as well at that time. So what we do is we try to heal the release uh, prisoners and release detainees. So using the body map, uh, psychiatrists and also psychologists in order to make them comfortable to speak out. We even use massage, leggy, football, everything we can to let them have some safe space. And the body map has been displayed also in Patani aspects. And also we're hoping to be bringing them here also. There is also the description by the family or by themselves uh, talking about what is pain and what is the story about that uh, art, no? It's, it's a way to also talking about the transitional justice and art. Uh, CRCF, also a member of Transitional Justice Asia Network. We use a lot of arts and also expressions in many ways in order to bring the victim, the family, and also those who are the stakeholder of the peace process to come and talk about truth, reconciliation, uh, truth, uh, reparation, persecution, and also reform. And that is where and how we can bring the victim centric for them to able to be speak out and share their experience. Okay, so yeah. let's go to, please, you want to comment on the trauma in Burmese or English? What? Yeah. Um, the post-traumatic, why we belong to European colleagues or Adika, เอ่อที่เปียวลุยได้ดูมันเนี่ยโหกูเพียกแค่ด้วยจงนี่อกุนลงเปียวเปียได้เตียกไปเปียเนี่ยไปเปียงายไปเปียเสียไปเปียเอ
ตุเรยะอจองนี่บ่เนาะตุเรนะปูยีเนี่ยสะดาปูจ้อเปียดาบ่เนาะตุเรอะแลปูพี่รอหูยินนี่ปิ้วรานยูรีตุเรซะลาน
the teachers, engineers, doctors, you know, they can be useful for the community. That, you know, but we think we are illegal. With the doctors over there, uh, you know, cannot practice their medical, you know, knowledge is there. So, you know, there should be some alternative, you know, for, for these talents to be used in Thailand. So I, it could be like, you know, mutual benefit for both Thai and Burma, you know, for us too, like, you know, we could be legal and then we can also make use of our skills there, you know, to make a better man of the community. And also Thailand side, actually like they are also, you know, benefiting from the, um, like the refugee like us that, you know, since we arrived from the 2021, like that town, Mesa was actually like you know, hit by COVID after the coup. So the, the border was, or, you know, totally closed down, shut down. But, you know, when we, all the refugees arrived there illegally, that all the house rental price went up and that, you know, all of the prices went up and that, you know, people over there got, you know, good businesses because of them. Like, especially most of the people uh, who are benefiting up. I'm not sure if I should feel it or not. The authorities, I don't know that, but you know, but we want to make it legal in any ways that, you know, we want uh, 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 like to be protected, but um, the situation is like, you know, uh, it's still there. Then also um, that, that is the job opportunity is the, the most important thing because not all of the people will be going to the US or to other tech countries. Like, we have about 20 to 30,000 of people, only like, you know, a few thousand of people will be relocating. Most of the people will be stuck in this small town. We are not able to go back to our country. And then we are actually officially stateless. You know, we have a lot of restrictions and challenges. So these things need to be solved. And also um, the trauma, you know, most of the people they may have thought has more or less trauma you know, they are in their background. Like, you know, uh, like Gopu himself, like he was in the prison. After that, you know, he was chased by the authority again and he had to flee here. And also uh, some other student leaders as well. And also like one of my uh, close uh, friends, so they are like, their son was a student leader before that he was killed by the military at his, at his safe house. And then like the whole family had to run away. But they lost their belongings, they lost their son, and that they had to restart their life in Mayasal from the ground zero. So like, uh, they have traumas. All of the people have traumas. So these traumas need to be healed in many ways that of course, add is the, 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 the main, one of the means to, you know, to, to do it. But, uh, you know, we cannot just heal trauma by itself. Like, you know, when people have the empty stomach, so we also have to create jobs for them too. And also for the, um, uh, transition adjusting, so we have to start from now, but we already started in it, like the documenting is very important, like all of the documenting of, of all of the happenings and the, the history of the people, but these things need to be there and also need to recognize all of the, the happenings and also need to like, you know, bring justice to them. But uh, right now, it's still quite uh, difficult for us uh, to bring justice because there is no justice like in Burma and also we cannot seek justice even in the Thailand swine as a refugee and as a stateless person and documented people. Like whatever happened to us, like we can just close our eyes and like, you know, just, you know, let it happen to us. So there is no justice for us yet. And also there are a few other steps to go forward for, to, to get the transition and justice. But uh, the most we can do right now is like just to do make the documentation of, you know, of happening there, and that we do need a lot of help there, you know, so we are working any kind of help, like, you know, uh, we just don't need many, you know, many is important, but we also need skills and knowledges and, you know, and, and, and any form of other support as well, you know, but one unfortunate thing is that uh, uh, for the NGOs and civil societies, we got you know, lesser funding to the uh, Burmese civil societies uh, in this year. So this is also one of the tragedy of, you know, of the, uh, of the people who are trying to support uh, the Burma, uh, Burma and, and, and the causes. Um, yeah, and also the, the, the last but not least is uh, about 
uh, to my Thai friends here is that the, the people, uh, they are favorite Burmese people who are in the you know, immigration detention center in uh, Bangkok here, so they need help. So one of my close friends, uh, he's been in the uh, INDC for more than one year now. So he was just like, just a CDMer, and he was in a warrant. He was just going to fetch his uh, family, two years old son and his wife who, to across the, the border. He was trying to fetch them from the border. He was arrested by the military, and he was imprisonment in the uh, mess of prison. But they did not deport him back to Burma. Instead, they just um, sent him to the uh, immigration detention here. So they're more than one year now at the detention center. He's not, not just one person. There are many other Burmese people who are involved in the revolution. And then they got, you know, a lot more problems here in the Thailand side. But, you know, we are looking for help that, you know, no one could help us yet so far. So this is uh, my personal request. You know, to I think my, we have a lot of session for this. So I think Thank we you. need to do a follow-up. But let me give the final word because there are still a few more things to say. Okay, then, please, Nadia. Yes. Just, just to comment on something you say about artists engaged in this kind of uh, process. Um, as we know, we all know the experience of Myanmar artists in during the reaction, the impressive reaction that they had after the coup is very impressive and, and, and admirable actually, because um, this engagement of, of young artists in, in every country have a, a, a big power under the population. But we are talking about countries who have younger, majority population also. So I think this is a very good strategy for advocacy process. Um, and talking about trauma, I think like you say, that it's very important that you try to avoid revictimization situations that they um, that, that put it in a very difficult place again. Uh, we know, for example, when you read the diaries of, of the artists or what happened with some of the political prisoners who are being uh, free in Myanmar and how they've been uh, followed and how they've been uh, threat uh, to the families also. And this is very important because uh, we are talking also that they're, they're just coming out from many abuse uh, in, in prison, like, um, and they're not, little like we are saying and this is also happening in Latin America uh, sexual abuse isolation physical torture we all know that kind of list that is uh, ongoing um, so avoid this revictimization means also that you have a possible way of uh, awareness or campaigns and civilizations about what's going on and that's maybe the first steps in societies where this issue is not very, you know, common to talk. Um, and the last thing I think in the Myanmar case, for example, compared to what happened in Nicaragua or in Venezuela, is that there is, a, and it's actually, actually worked a lot in, in, in Latin America, is that the diplomatic pressure was also from inside. So um, the the requests from embassies and high level senior officials, foreign officials in different levels, in different structures, including the private sector, was important to the free, to free these uh, political prisoners. For example, in Nicaragua, it was bad because they put it in a plane and they say, you never go back, but that at least they put it out of jail. So I think this, we always talk about diplomatic pressure, but on outside level to the international community, but uh, inside is, I think, more strategy. And to the last thing, um, yes, I completely agree on you that uh, to uh, this information, these testimonials are so important, like I say, because, um, this information cannot be lost. So we have in many countries, several abuse, human rights abuse for decades, especially when you have repressive regimes and it takes a lot of time after to reveal in every single case. So my only um, 
reflection on this is that, that the time to start, like you say, is now, even if we don't know how to present this information, but at least we have it and at least we can use it after. Uh, because yes, um, maybe trying to legal actions to uh, support and to repair the victims is the main objective. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with this, I think we have concluded the panel, but I won't give uh, two minutes to Oni to tell us about to read the like she yes, we are the people and bomb as with a sling is actually part of an initiative of sling it's the name of the group and also this uh, jacket which is with uh, a painting of uh, our artists but just done now is the idea to communicate to a general public through the use of mods. So maybe on it, you can tell us two minutes about this. I am sorry, I'm not really prepared to speak, but uh, I am a photographer and uh, normally my works are seen in museums and uh, galleries. And uh, I thought that it's not enough. I thought that uh, we have to go to the streets. And the only way to go to the streets is to become billboards ourselves. Because if we will not do it, I don't think that up, they will do it for us. So I start to work on it two years ago. And we are working together and we hope to succeed and we hope to work on other realities, not only on the Burmese, because it's all one, actually. It's all about power and how it is uh, handling on us in many, many realities everywhere, actually. So all together, we can make a change. I am really think that we can. We have, we have this t-shirt outside. This is actually from a Myanmar poet. Uh, uh, the, the, they shoot us in the head, but the revolution is in the art or something like that. Yeah, so there are very beautiful uh, writing as well as design. And uh, again, we have the catalog and we have the postcard. So do support us on your way out. You can give a donation and then after the donation, you can enjoy uh, Myanmar food outside is for all uh, to so that we can talk more about this important and learn to know each other better. And please do, uh, normally for the exhibition, all the chairs are not around, so you can look at the drawing more carefully. So we will try to take the chair out as soon as possible so that you can come back and take a look at the drawing uh, more carefully because it's worth to spend uh, time. So with this, thank you to our speaker.